Thiago. I'm from Sebrap. Uh, we are in a kind of tight schedule here. So we we'll have 15 minutes for each one of you. And afterwards, Humberto will make a real discussion. And if there is time, we will open for questions. And the first one to present her paper today will be Maria Angelica Penas de Fago. She's from National University of Cordoba, Argentina. Her paper is called Backlashes in Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Latin America, the Abortion Debate in El Salvador. So, Maria Angelica. Thank you, thank you Tiago, and thank you for to the organizers to invite me, to accept me in this so interesting meeting. Well, uh, the talk that I will try to present to you is it's about the abortion lawfare in El Salvador. As Tiago said, I'm from Argentina. I'm from National University of Cordoba. But I work in El Salvador case because this presentation is part of a an international project based in Bergen University in Norway called Abortion Lawfare in Latin America. And this presentation, I have to say, is from, I'm, I'm teach uh, sociology of law in the School of Law in Cordoba, and these presentations combine or begin from this perspective. The, the aim of the project, of the whole project, international project, who consider case of El Salvador, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and so on. And, and a case study, a comparative case study, uh, aims, uh, the, the aim was analyze the strategic use of the right and law in the battle over abortion right in Latin America and the various effects of this lawfare between opposition groups. In this international project, I work, as I mentioned before, about the Salvadorian case. In El Salvador, like in other countries of Latin America, the abortion rights have been highly controversial for a long time. Civil society actors have adopted diverse legal and illegal formal and informal strategies to engage with the legal institution in order to further policy reform and social change, so as to advance or restri restrict sorry, the abortion rights. Considering this scenario in question, I tried to dialogue with some of the theoretical frames. Here I just show some of them, of, of course, is the, fair, the first slide. Some of the main authors that I consider in this research, um, these theoretical frames we try to describe what are the role played by the courts over the political and social abortion dispute. Thus, I consider the research who asks about the role played by court in a political debate of abortion in some countries of Latin America, like a case, like a case of Mexico or Colombia, for instance. I also consider other approaches that attempt to describe the actor and the strategies used by these actors in their dispute over abortion rights, including the emergencies of the conservative legal mobilization in the courts and other political spaces. Other important studies that I consider were those academic contributions that show how the abortion right play a central role in the current political campaigns where the presidential candidates, as well as candidates to the parliament. In, in Brazil, you have the very clear case of Dilma in 2006, I guess. Um, request to express their position on abortion, and sometimes they are even asked to show their commitment to this issue and other sexual and reproductive rights issues. In terms of religious influence, I consider different authors who reflects in their analysis based on Latin America, the specificities of national context where the Catholic hierarchies are often perceived as the central axis of the conservative activism. 
This analytical approach is in general part of the other case study. Given the culture and political influence of the Catholic Church in the region, and also do the emergence of the evangelical churches as influ influential actors in the contemporary sexual policies, especially in Central America and more recently in South American countries. Can we change the slide? Yeah. If I have to, to mention some clues to understand, this, to understand the Salvador case, we have met with a series of new academic challenge uh, entailed by the creation of the conservative interreligious alliance. If in the past the Catholic Church led the position to the abortion in this Central American country, in the last few years, the rise of the conservative and evangelical church changed the landscape opposition against. The phenomena is not unique to the Salvadorian case. These phenomena are clearly revealed in the case of Brazil, Peru, and more recently in Chile. As I mentioned, some clues to understand the, the, understand, sorry, the Salvador case study. For this, I use different methodological tools that, I, that permit to allow us to contextualize and study the strategies in the political and legal field in the Salvadoran case, and in some cases, such tools also permit us to identify the strategies, variabilities, the alliance, and the power play on the main actor involved in this dispute over abortion. Our first approach to the case study was based on the analysis of the legal reform in the 90s. Uh, El de Salvador framed the peace agreement in 1992 in Mexico, and after this period of the democracy, many things changed in the political, legal landscape that impact in the abortion right debate. In fact, in this period, we studied the main action political media discussions deployed by the key actor belonging to a penalizing alliance at that time, through which we learned about the fusion of the political and moral agenda of the Catholic Church hierarchy, the arena, the political party, the right political party, which was in power well into uh, the 21th century and the Catholic, one of the more important Catholic NGOs called Just to Life. In a deeper analysis on how this penal reform was approved, something that I have to mention at the beginning. El Salvador is one of the five countries on, uh, around the whole world that is where the abortion is absolutely banned. Any case of abortion is permitted in, in El Salvador since the middle of the 90s. In the literature review, inter, literature review and in interview with the key actor, we are able to track the maintenance of this pattern based on general roles. <coughs> this traditional gender role has played an important role before, during, and after the Civil War in El Salvador, despite the fact that in the context of the guerrilla, many women who held key positions cracked the traditional mandate. In other level, we observe how the fact that the FMLN, the guerrilla, which became a political party after the Paso Agreement in 1992, impact over its political agenda. In other words, the term of its political agenda began to have heavily marked by electoral process. And as in another country of Latin America, and again, the abortion political support usually disappeared during the electoral campaign. For instance, in El Salvador, historical confrontation that in front the time of the armed conflict between the right party, ARENA, and the left party, FMLN, are still today impacting the legal dispute over abor abortion in different ways. Just just in countries like Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Brazil. In El Salvador, abortion issues tend to become a high matter in electoral campaigns because the arena hegemony after the peace agreement and due the sustainable campaign organized by conservative actors against the FMLN that was labeled as promoted of the destruction of the family and children to be born. Still today, this is the kind of discourses that the arena promote in the public space. As a consequence 
consequence of this dispute, the FMLM removed for years the abortion issue from its agenda. Agenda, sorry. This decision was related to a strategy deployed by FMLN to position itself as not simply the leftist alternative, but rather than a center left option. Thus, we think that the moral and ideological characters impressed during and after the Civil War, together with the political factor mentioned before, highlight how on a series of events that took place in the context of the legal reform. In our analytical, analytical timeline, we could see how in the middle of the 21st century, the abortion debate emerged in the public sphere in Salvador, especially thanks to the action led by one of the civil society organizations called Agrupación Ciudadana por la Despenalización del Aborto, Terapeutico, Ético y Eugenésico, the Citizen Association for the Decriminalization of the Therapeutic, therapeutic Ethical and Genic Abortion. The feminist movement and their allies, many of them from abroad, tried to challenge the absolute ban through the legal mobilization in the Supreme Court. Can you change the slide? Yes. Thanks. Up to today, the constitutional branch of the Supreme Court rejected and constitutional and constitutionality of the abortion total ban regime in four opportunities. These are the four opportunities that the Supreme Court rejected the petition asked by civil society. One of the effects of the legal restriction which, play, which is placed on abortion in El Salvador is the active policies persecution of the women who have abortion and their subsequent conviction. Even women who are who have suffered miscarriage have been sent to trial and incarcerated. In many of these cases, the sentences for imposed are not related to the abortion. During the legal process, oh, okay. During the legal process, where in most of the cases are evidence of serious flaw, abortion convi conviction are changed into the homicide conviction. And under, under this legal frame, sentences range for 30 to 50 years. Most of these processes are initiated by health personnel for public health centers where women go to search for help when suffering from aesthetic complication. In this context of highly women persecution, the legal and political strategies related to these issues start to deepen and diversify in El Salvador, not only in the international sphere, but also in, inside the country. It's important to mention here how the international public is scutrine, is scutrine, is scutrine? Some, in some sense, promote and reinforce the need to articulate legal strategies by the local election. <coughs> Do they repeat the denial on the part of the Supreme Court to voice its position in favor of the legislation reform and in context of a stranger movement for abortion legalization, the legal and political strategy relates to this issue start to deepen and diversify. Some of these examples for the campaign ask for pardon for a 17 pardon petition to the General Assembly in El Salvador in 2014. Today, as a result of different legal action promoted by the Agrupación Ciudadana or other feminist activism, almost 20 women have been freed in El Salvador. But this visibility that the Salvadorian case gained at the national and international sphere regarding the consequence of the total criminaliz criminalization of the abortion in El Salvador has had also repercussion on the discourses and mode of action by conservative sector. The interpretation of the result that the legal mobilization led by feminist movement impact in CEFOC action discourses and response of the traditional conservative act actors in this country. Such sectors have pro progressively begun to secularize their identity, discourses, and line of action in order to be part of the actor involved in the international human rights arena. The recent action of the conservative actor into the human rights debate indicate how they consider international law as a way to strengthen the illegal status quo of pregnancy interruption in El Salvador. 
This is phenomenal we can see in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and other countries of Latin America. This phenomenon puts the very legitim legitimacy of such a spear of, and of the discourse of the human right turns controversial, one of the key strategies with progressive sector use for decades. From this scenario, it's necessary to, necessary to go more deeply into the multiple impacts that the legal and political feminist mobilization proceed from international human rights arena, because in many cases we can see like a kind of boomerang effect using a reinterpretation, the idea of keg and seeking in order to try to analyze the transnational conservative actors movement. Let me take it to, in order to finish. <coughs> in connection with this, we think that the importance of generating knowledge from the transpersonal approach, that is, it, that is a view that compromises the perspective of different organized sectors that are opposed to the abortion right, right, not only in El Salvador. We hope that there are, there are our next step, not only with respect to our work in El Salvador, but during, but also in relation to our reset research in other countries of Latin America. We will suspect conduct research on the abortion debate on the basis of cross-sectional views that make it possible to understand with a greater depth the complicity of conservative activism in contemporary sexual politics in Latin America. Convening of the continuity and abrupt of ruptures of the conservative activists as analytical dimension will make, may, will make it possible to extend the approach and to analyze the complexity of its transformation in relation to different political, legal, and socio-cultural and economic scenarios. For instance, we need to concentrate further on the interreligious inter alliance, not only at the national level, but also at the international level state. We have a lot of, of work ahead, and we hope to, to continue to develop this research. Sorry for the time. I have more things to share, but I don't have more time. Thank Sorry. you very much. <laughs> no, it's OK. And uh, now we pass, to, pass the word to Simone Gomez. She's from Rio de Janeiro State University. And she would speak about culture against narco violence, lessons from activists in Brazil and in Mexico. Simone, the I... microphone. Do you mind uh, the PowerPoint presentation? Hi, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Simone, and I'm from State University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, and I would like to thank everyone who is still here at 4.30 to, read, to listen to us. Um, and uh, I would like to ask uh, an apology in advance for reading, because I think this will make it easy for me to um, be able to make it in 15 minutes. Um, I think my research my PhD research uh, treats an important issue in the light of the happenings of last week, the assassination of Marielle Franco in Rio de Janeiro, especially because I've been thinking uh, for the last five years how human rights defenders and um, activists from different movements, especially uh, new social movements, uh, are able to mobilize and as it said, was said uh, here earlier, it's not easy always to mobilize in certain conditions and in Latin American contexts. I've been researching Mexico and Brazil, especially the west zone of uh, Rio de Janeiro, with the zone of militias, and uh, Guerrero in Mexico, that I think all of you, most of you have heard from the uh, Tsnapa massacre uh, in 2015, the last, the disappearance disappearance of 43 students in um, the end of September 2014. Uh, what I came to present this afternoon is a partial result of my uh, research, that is how activists are able to mobilize and how do they mobilize uh, in context of 
what I call routine violence that is uh, especially related to narco trafficking. Um, the in routine violence environments are environments where there's a prolifer proliferation of violent actors in the, in the context of uh, narco violencia. Uh, I think in Brazil, in the last few weeks, we have been listening more to this uh, expression, narco violencia. But in Mexico, it's a uh, common ground that people already think that there are severe violence that are um, several violence that are related to uh, narco trafficking. Uh, although it's more common in Mexico and in Brazil, I use this category to analyze uh, this violence related to narco traffic. Um, and I will present this paper in four parts. First, I will briefly introduce my research. Then I will talk about narco violencia in Guerrero and in Rio. So later discuss the cultural solution, and I say it solution is a partial solution for activism, as I called in both contexts, and conclude with some final remarks. Um, to introduce this research, I'd like to first make some brief comments on my field work and on my methodology. I've researched, and I think some of you here in, the, in, the, uh, in this event have also researched what they call violent environments, and this poses several questions to the researcher, especially related to your personal security and the, the uh, amount of data and the quality of the data that you can gather. And in the west zone of Rio, and both in Guerrero, it was uh, really hard to interview activists. And this is what led me to research spe uh, specifically cultural activism, because you won't find union uh, activism. You won't find mobilizations that easy because of, spe because of the, my hypothesis, no? because of the violent organization of the routine of the quotidian life. Uh, it, what connects both uh, fieldworks, both um, contexts that I've researched is, is both a high level of poverty and crime rates. Uh, I'm talking about assassination, murder rates, uh, kidnapping, robbery, and also very related to narco-trafficking organization of quotidian life. Um, while Guerrero is a rural state with uh, no sewage in more than 80% of its area, the west zone of Rio is urbanized, but it's both a, a mixture of favelas, slums, and uh, periphery that has to deal with militia violence, militia uh, coercion, organization of uh, quotidian life. Um, they both, though, share problems regarding public transportation, a mistrust towards the state, and a difficulty to mobilize or to public or sensibly um, mobilize, and also a severe militarization of some of its areas. And I think this is important to be said in the context that we are right now in Rio uh, regarding the federal intervention and the, the possibility of the military to stay in those areas and what it does it means for activism in those contexts. Um, for this research, I've interviewed 25 activists in both contexts, and they, they were young people from 19 to 24 years old, and they were inserted in different movements, LGBT, um, cultural movements as a whole, like guerrilla communication, they call, and um, radio, uh, radio community that are researched in Guerrero. And they both lived and were established their activism in those areas. Um, I've done some field work uh, besides conducting some semi-structured interviews. And uh, spent an et ethnographical period in uh, in a neighborhood of the West Zone called Campo Grande. I've, I've brought some pictures, but this is first uh, a city called Santa Cruz del Rincón in Guerrero, that was in Mexico, that it got famous in 95, 1995 for its uh, solution to uh, the narco trafficking violence. That was the Policia Comunitaria, as they say which is a policia with policemen that were men, retired men especially, and uh, young men that protect the community. Um, and as I said before, for the mistrust towards state officials and state policemen, because of corruption and police violence, they started this uh, sort of activism, as they call it, especially indigenous activism. Um, 
the second part of this presentation, I'd like to present a, a little bit of what they call narco, narco violence. Narco violence. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk about this later, thank you. Um, narco violence on top context of this, the places I decided to study. I'm talking about is states with high levels of disappearances and homicide rates, and especially and directly linked to the war on drugs policy that Richard Nixon established in the end of the 60s that have uh, uh, a special effect on Mexico and on Brazil, especially because of the uh, dictature in Brazil and the Guerra Sucia, the dirty war in Mexico in the end of the 60s, when activists were persecuted and disappeared and, and murdered for their activism. So it's no wonder that Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, El Salvador, and other contexts, uh, contexts in Latin America have the highest rates of uh, death of uh, political activists. And I think the assassination of Marielle Franco somehow also uh, represents that. Um, but our context of extreme repression, creating an env environment that stigmatizes lower classes, and in particular poor black people in Rio de Janeiro and indigenous black people, indigenous pe men in Guerrero. Uh, in Guerrero, uh, the war on drugs had a significant uh, increase after 2011 when they started the war on drugs policy by Felipe Calderon, the president elected, and um, no, sorry, in 2006. And the results of those war on drugs are a significant increase in the violence rate of this state, and also the severe increase on the activists dead, persecuted, and incarcerated. And I think the Ayotzinapa massacre in the end of uh, 2014 uh, uh, exemplifies that in Iguala, in the state, uh, in the city of Guerrero. Uh, Brazil in general, and Rio de Janeiro in particular, suffer also the effects of this war on drugs, and this is part of my hypothesis, especially in favela and peripheries, uh, as in the West Zone, where I, I done, I've done some field work in the last years, because especially of the violent confrontation of militias and narco-trafficking and police violence. Uh, militias are policemen, former policemen and drug traffickers and other state ag agents that offer protection uh, from some of you that might not know, but uh, they are heavily armed and they, they not exactly offer protection as a public benefit or public sector, but they um, coerce the inhabitants of these uh, environments. And they also, and this is part of my hypothesis, prevent that social movement and that activists uh, gather. What takes me to the third part of this presentation is how cultural activisms are relatively safe forms of saying uh, public safety issues and public, uh, and public related problems of these areas that are very coercive areas, as I mentioned before. And uh, they are able to gather and find uh, collect, uh, collective solutions to violence uh, toward, uh, regarding public uh, mobilizations. What I came across what was that cultural related activism as poetry reading, <coughs> poetry reading communication groups and guerrilla communication groups, as I said before. As I, as I can show you, this is uh, in the Hill Buena Vista where uh, I've done some field work and this is a community radio. Uh, this is the, um, the local community police and forces in Santa Cruz de Rincón, also in Guerrero, in Mexico, thank you. Another city of Tlapa de Comunfort. Guerrero is a state that suffered a lot with Guerra Sucia, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the 70s. Of they had the highest rates of disappearing of activism and um, human rights defenders. Okay. And this is Campo Grande. This is a neighbor of. Uh, of um, you can pass. Uh, this is a space of popular education group in Campo Grande. Also Campo Grande. It's okay. Thank you. Um, culture for that being, uh, I, I understood in my, my research as a more safe, secure form of activism. A solution to talk about unsafety issues and unsafe with less surveillance, which is very important in those contexts as you might imagine, and less problematic because they are more hidden. 
um, James Scott in the 70s was already talking about everyday peasant uh, uh, resistance, and I think this is part of my hypothesis as well. Um, the thought of mobilizing throughout culture, uh, culture raises important questions, I think. How effective are those mobilizations if they are not that public? And I've been asked this uh, earlier in formal presentations, and I would like to think with you how one should measure, how one can measure what is effective in social movements, what can we see uh, that, that uh, quick. Also, the transna transnationalism of activism in those areas where activism is life-threatening issue is an important finding. Um, this is the last part, and I'm about to finish. I think several international NGOs uh, support, whether financially or with logistics, activism in context of routine violence. And these are found in both, in both contexts, in Rio and in Guerrero. In those uh, cases, the visibilization of those activism uh, poses severe threats and violence. So it's important that they are also visibilized, but at the same time protected by some sort of, uh, some sort of more legitimized uh, institution as an NGO, an international NGO. And here I would like to, to remember the two-year assassination of Berta Cáceres in Honduras, uh, who posed a severe threat to a transnational uh, that was in her pueblo, in Pueblo Lenca, in Honduras, and, but also the, the assassination of Marielis Franco uh, um, last week in Rio. And I think um, this is a sad comprobation of how the, of the risk activism face in uh, not only in Central America, but in Latin America as a whole, and how cultural, uh, cultural related activism pose somehow less um, a menace to the system, but at the same time, they are a form of collective gathering and collective decision um, making a solution for those um, activisms in those countries. I think I have one last photo, I think. This is a um, folder from a festival it's called Resiste Iguala in Guerrero, exactly the, the state where um, the, the disappearance, the first disappearance of the 43 students in Ayotzinapa. I think I have one last one. Um, thank you very much. Now we show here the presentation of Douglas Block from University of Chicago. He will present the the work Security Policies in Brazil. So Douglas. Yeah. Uh, thank you all very much for the opportunity to present. It's a really interesting conference. Um, I really enjoyed and hoping to get your feedback on some of this work in progress. Uh, so yeah, so this project, generally you can call it Security Policies in Brazil or Politics and Public Security Policies in Brazilian States. Now, when we look at Brazil, there's kind of this huge puzzle which is Basically, since the new constitution came into effect, we've seen a lot of decline in inequality, as we discussed today. And typically, when we have decline in inequality, you also see a decline in violence, right? There's this massive literature that discusses that. We don't see that in Brazil, right? So we see, over the last 25 or 30 years, violence has gone up tremendously, right? So in the early 1990s, you're talking about a rate of about 21 or 22, which the UN considers, I believe, five or 10 per 100,000 victims an epidemic. So it's already an epidemic, and it's only gotten worse over time. And to put in perspective, when you look at the numbers, from 89 to 2017, you had 1.3 million murders. Uh, that was pretty much well, all the casualties uh, in the Vietnam War. Uh, this, in 2016, which is really the most recent year we have data on, you had 61,000 homicides. And besides the human cost, which is quite large in of itself, you also have a major economic cost. So if we think of all crime, the estimated effect is about $93 billion in 2004, right? So 5% of Brazil's GDP is lost to violence. Uh, if we think about just homicides, um, it's about $7.5 billion and you had 2.15 million years of life lost, right? Because most homicide victims tend to be young men or men between the ages of 14 to 29. So when people die at that age, you have a huge loss of life. Okay, 
So if that was the end of the puzzle, then maybe it's just something in Brazil. Uh, okay, sorry, actually. So when we think of violence as a political issue of why we should actually care about it, we see that when crime and violence go up, you tend to have increased support for coups, right, military intervention. Um, and we see a general decline in support for and satisfaction with democracy, right? When there's a lot of crime, a lot of violence, but just let the military take over, they can deal with it better. And when you ask Brazilian voters, and this is LAPOP data, the Latin American Public Opinion Project, until 2016, when the economy started collapsing, uh, security was considered the most important issue for voters, surpassing uh, health care, uh, corruption. I should mention in 2016, corruption has gone up. It's actually more. There's a whole category just called politicians are the biggest problem, which gets 10% by itself. Um, but even then, we still see that security is an important issue for people over time. But we're left with this big puzzle, which is why inequality has been declining. But we see differences across states and across cities in violence, right? There is not a clear-cut movement in every state of violence increasing. All right, so let's consider the center west of Brazil. Violence was high, but it's remained fairly steady over the past 25 years or so. If we go to southeast Brazil, Sorry, this color in yellow is uh, Sao Paulo. Violence declined very heavily in Sao Paulo, like a 75% drop over that time. It's declined in Rio, and recently it's declined in Espírito Santo. It's increased in Minas Gerais, right? So you see this very heavy drop in this region. Northeast Brazil, which uh, something to keep in mind is the scale. So right here, you see violence. They went from having about 15 or 20 homicides per 100,000 people to having 40 or even some cases higher, depending on the state. And then northern Brazil, it's going up at fairly steady rates uh, over time. But, so this is the puzzle, is why is this happening? Why are we seeing these regional differences and even within states, right? So if you go back to northeast Brazil, violence has gone up in most places. In Pernambuco, it declined very heavily under Eduardo Campos. So what's going on here? Now, the typical approaches to studying crime in Brazil and generally uh, cross nationally is look at kind of two things, right? So the first is economic issues. And uh, the basic idea behind this is, well, you have a lot of crime because there's a lot of inequality and a lot of resource deprivation, right? So uh, when people commit crime because committing a crime, robbing a bank, is easier than going to work, especially if you have low education, right? You're going to get much more bigger return. Um, we have this idea of relative economic situation, which is when you have a lot of inequality, people get angry. So if you have a favela in South Rio, which is right next to Copacabana and the multi-million dollar homes, people are going to see that and wonder why they're not having that, so they're going to commit crime. And then you have this broader belief about social controls, right? When there's a lot of inequality, the social controls don't exist at the uh, lower class levels. And we do see some support for these, right? So these last two are from Brazil, so we see that reducing inequality. It reduces property crimes, but we actually don't see a decline in violence. And then we get this other uh, more recent research, which looks at the effect of Bolsa Familia in Sao Paulo, and they actually find it pretty much reduces all forms of crime, right? So you kind of have some evidence to support this, right? And a lot of research is being done on this. Oh, so the second thing we have, especially in Brazil, is a lot of emphasis on the criminal justice system, right? And so kind of the paradox of this whole research is that People trust the police more when crime is low, but the police are better at reducing crime when people trust the, uh, when people trust them. So you can't have one necessarily without the other. So they're kind of stuck in this thing. And so the question is, is well, how do we increase uh, trust in police, or how do we get the police to be more effective? All right. So there's been some work in individual states. So we have the some work on the Police of Results program in Minas Gerais, which shows that the police actually plan things out and use data, they can reduce crime. Um, 
do you have a, this is just one example on Pact for Life. There's, I'm sure, about 15 or 20 dissertations and a lot of publications looking at Pact for Life in Pernambuco. And then you have some other work that's looking now more at how the federal government is coordinating security policies, right? So typically the federal government has actually stayed out of state level policies. Uh, we also have some, a lot of research on police violence, right? So people don't trust the police because they're violent. So if you look here, about six year period, you have about 18,000 police homicides. We also see the other side, which is the police die at very high rates. So Rio, 1995 to 2017, you had 3,100 police officers killed on and off duty. Kind of put it in perspective, that's what all the coalition forces have lost in Afghanistan since 2001. But what you see missing from the literature and what my kind of broader project argued is that we need to take a look at state politics, right? There's really not much on how state politics affects violence. And why is this fairly puzzling? Brazil, the way the Constitution was set up, gives the governor complete control over public security, right? You have the federal police who are on highways and they're on railways, uh, but for the most part, they cannot intervene in state politics without the governor's express approval. And most of the time they have it. Now, of course, uh, Rio de Janeiro had to be the exception a couple of weeks before this presentation started, but one exception over that entire time period which shocked everyone. Uh, we also see there's not really any federal laws about what the governor has to do for security. So the Constitution gives minimum spending levels for healthcare and for education, for security, you know, everyone can do what they want, right? No minimum, no maximum. So there's a lot of room for gubernatorial discretion. And so my claim in the broader project is basically that governors focus on policies that they can rapidly implement and will reduce crime quickly to the detriment of the more long-term policies. All right, and so what tools do the governors have to reduce crime? So I argue basically they have four main tools. So one, here's the central one, which all of these kind of move out of, and that's policy change. So this can involve a few things. So one is policy coordination. You can coordinate with local actors in government, right? Your mayors, your vereadores, et cetera. Um, you can spend more on law enforcement or on education, something we'll talk about both. Um, you can also affect public security in individual cities by giving some cities more than others. Uh, this is something we don't know very much about because they hide the data under the secrecy laws by saying it's vital to national security so no one can have access to the data. Um, and then we have just what I would term policy change in other aspects. And this is something that's a little more vague category, which I'd like to get your feedback on, which is basically governors from some parties or the other are going to behave differently. Okay, so how do I operationalize this? So we have the policy coordination, as we mentioned. Maybe the governor and mayor are from the same party. You'll have lower crime rates. They coordinate more, they get more resources. Um, you can spend more on law enforcement if you want to take a militarized approach to security. You can also spend more on education, right? Education has been shown to reduce crime in the long term, definitely. The evidence is a little more suspect in the short term. Um, you can also influence crime rates in cities by giving them different amounts of resources. And then finally, the last one is policy change. So if you run the numbers, this is something to do with my project, and look at how voters punish different parties or different governors for security problems, you'll find out that they punish right parties at about three times as much as they punish left parties for security problems, right? My theory behind this is right parties say they have this reputation of we're gonna cut or crack down on crime. And so if you come into office with that belief, uh, or people elect you with that belief, when you fail to achieve that, they're gonna punish you more. How am I doing? Four minutes. Five minutes. Okay, so I'll go very quickly. So I have a case study from Pernambuco. So basically what we have in Pernambuco is uh, several gubernatorial periods, basically from 1990 to present. The red line up top is spending on security per capita. The blue line is per capita security spending, which has remained flat. And then we see the homicide rate, which is in this other color, which is more difficult to see. 
Uh, so if you look at that overall, violence went up in Pernambuco every year until about 2007. An interesting thing about this, this occurred across uh, what we consider right governor from the PFL. We have the PSB, Miguel Arais. It also went up under his watch. And then you have under PMDB, Jar Jarvis Vasconcelos, it also increased. And then it only declined, declined under Eduardo Campos in 2007. Um, so just to go to, since we're short on time, basically in the beginning of the 1990s, you really didn't have any sort of sub public security policy, right? People just focused on, we'll put some police out there and hope things go well. Um, and they didn't very much go well, right? Violence went up. There would be occasionally increases in public security spending. So when Arise was in power, the police went on strike. Crime went really bad and quickly. And he was forced to give them concessions. So you saw a huge spike in the budget. But since you're not doing anything, you're just paying the same people more. There wasn't any change in violence. Uh, in the 2000s, under Jarvis Vasconcelos, we see the very first uh, kind of emphasis on uh, public security uh, policies. He had the first policy pretty much in the state's history. And I think one of the interesting contrasts between what he did, the PMDB and Arais, I don't think this is necessarily a uh, partisanship issue. If you look at their electoral bases, one, Arais had an electoral base in the rural areas, and Vasconcelos had these electoral base in the capital area, and violence is much worse in urban areas as opposed to rural areas, particularly Recife. Um, so 2006, you have Eduardo Campos comes into power. He's from a very powerful political family. Uh, he implements the Pact for Life, which was this kind of multi-strategy public security program, which had around 100 different things. But while he talked a lot about you know, social problems and all these things, he basically came down to incentivizing police officers through various means. So what are the means? Well, if you reduce crime, there's goals. So integrated security areas are large areas that a particular police commander is in charge of. So if they were in the top five, you would get a bonus. If you're an individual police officer and you seize weapons, you get a bonus. And if you seize crack, you also get a bonus, right? So this is all about kind of a punitive approach to security that focuses on putting people into prison. But you do also have some accountability. So they have weekly meetings where the governor will attend a lot. And so if you're in public security, so this includes um, uh, attorneys, the prison system, the police, et cetera. So if you're a police officer and you're doing a bad job, you get to stand up in front of 80 or 90 people and say why you're doing a bad job and how you're going to improve it. Uh, but even though we just focused on repression, it was actually a very successful policy, at least in the short term. Now it's starting to fail again. But violence went down heavily. And if we think about the political ramifications, so in 2006 when he came into power, his first round votes were 34%. He was re-elected with 83% of votes in 2010, right? So this was a major political victory for him. So that's just a simple uh, case study. I also have more data, which I'll be happy to talk about later. But this is then municipal data for all of Brazil. So uh, cities that have more than 20,000 people, the results are the same if you include every city in Brazil uh, from 97 to 2014. And the big thing is the municipal homicide rates. And so. Basically, what do we find is homicide rates are actually about 5% lower when you have a right governor in power as opposed to a left governor in power. Uh, we see that increasing education spending actually does lead to immediately a short-term reduction in violence, right? Around 10% for 60 reais per person, which is a steep price, but it's still pretty good. We actually don't see very much policy coordination, right? Having a mayor from the same party as the governor doesn't reduce violence. And then lastly, we, we don't see that more security spending by itself reduces violence. Now, the thing is by itself, if you run an interaction term and you look at the numbers and you say how much of the governor's support came from this city and how much was spent on law enforcement. And so this for an average city, which gives the governor about 2% of his total votes. And once you get over 100 reais, the security spending starts reducing violence. Right? In my interpretation, this is in wealthier states. The governor is directing a lot more resources to those places that are politically important for him. Right? So it's very much a politicization of security. All right. So what are the main conclusions we can draw from this? 
I think it talks about the importance of state actors. Pretty much they've been ignored when we talk about public security in Brazil, kind of examining over time what factors explain differences in violence across states. So not just one state for one policy. You know, studying Pact for Life is great, or the UPIP is, but that's one period of time. Looking across states, we have different political cultures, uh, different governors in power. Um, and I think it also just points to, you know, public security has a lot, politics has a lot to do with public security. Uh, you can't look at them in isolation, right? So in focusing on inequality is great. We learn a lot from that, but we also need to take into account the role of institutions. Thank you. And finally, we will have Jose de Souza Muniz Jr. Uh, he is from Sierra State University. He will present his paper, uh, Cultural Policies and Political Cultures, Patterns of Interaction Between LGBT activists and the Brazilian Ministry of Culture. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for staying here uh, to listen to us. Uh, I would like first to thank the organizers of the event for this opportunity to present the results of our research, especially back to homeland and back to the university where I had my, my education. Uh, this is a special opportunity for me as well because this issue is quite different from the ones I had been working on before. Um, I conducted this research in 2017 together with Professor Alexandre Barbalho as part of the activities of the Cultural and Communication Policies Study Group that we coordinate. Uh, it also falls under the culture, difference and inequality line of research of our postgraduate program in sociology at Sierra State University. Uh, the object of our study is a set of programs and institutional mechanisms developed by the Ministry of Culture, which is called MINC of Brazil, during the mandates of Lula and Dilma Rousseff that were especially for the LGBT uh, community. Um, I bring this case, uh, uh, this case study here because I think it allows us to uh, raise some reflections on the relationship between difference and inequality. Uh, just to put in very simple words, uh, we are talking about uh, cultural policies that somehow intend to be politics for recognition of differences and also they somehow pretend to be addressing inequality. Uh, it sounds kind of rude, kind of mean, but I think that the criticism is, is necessary. Um, the starting point for our analysis was 2004, when the Ministry's uh, Secretariat on Identity and Cultural Diversity created the Working Group for the Promotion of the LGBT Citizenship. At that point, it was called GLBT uh, Citizenship. The end point is 2009, when the Ministry issued the last call for proposals focused on the cultural activities of the LGBT community. Uh, these initiatives emerged through participatory policy mechanisms that were inexistent prior to the PT government. As a result of the restructuring of the ministry during the Gilberto Gil administration, a series of spaces for participation were created, such as commissions, councils, uh, conferences, forums, and so on, uh, so that culture makers uh, could interact directly uh, with official policymaking bodies. Um, the two main objectives of the study were, first, uh, to understand the process that shapes the cultural agendas of the Brazilian LGBT movement and their institutionalization through the adoption of cultural policies by the federal government. And second, to analyze the relationships between the LGBT activists and policymakers in the area of culture. Well, the backdrop of this discussion is the existence of a discursive field that portrays minorities as subjects of cultural rights that deserve special attention. Uh, in relation to cultural policies, uh, this discourse began, began to be used in recent decades as actors succeeded in using the notion of diversity uh, to broaden the concept of culture in cultural policies. Uh, at the international level, you may know, this change has been confirmed in documents produced by UNESCO since the 90s, uh, namely the report of the World Commission on Culture and Development, entitled Our Creative Diver Diversity, and also the Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. 
uh, the United Nations guidance put this issue on the agenda of debate among uh, the member states, especially after the Convention on Diversity was ratified uh, in 2007 in case of Brazil. Uh, Brazil played a leading role in the creation of these new instruments in UNESCO. Uh, we can easily observe uh, during Lula's government especially, uh, the importance given to the notion of diversity in the MINX program documents in the 2000s. Uh, in the official discourse, the use of the plural form of concepts such as na national identity and Brazilian culture is recur recurrent. The underlying goal of this change in discourses is to bring light to the numerous Brazils that exist in the country and work with the multiple cultural manifestations and their various ethnic, religious, gender, and regional uh, matrices, among others. Uh, this new policy direction become evident when the five chambers linked to the National Arts Foundation, which are, were visual arts, music, theater, dance, and circus, were increased to 18 sectoral boards, uh, all under the umbrella of the National Council of Cultural Policy. In this new structure, uh, representatives of the classical areas of cultural policies share spaces and resources with emerging areas such as food culture, hip hop, LGBT culture, and so on. Uh, this expansion allowed a series of culture makers that are not part of the artistic class uh, in the strict sense uh, to interact with the government's official cultural policy. Uh, to understand this change, we must take into consideration the fact that the reintroduction of a broader concept of culture in cultural policies gained legitimacy in a context where culture was, and still is, uh, seen as a management technology for intervening in reality. In recent decades, a new epistemic structure that treats culture as a resource has won political momentum. According to it, symbolic production can and must be placed at the service of causes that are not strictly culture, cultural, uh, including easing social tensions and conflicts and violence and so on. Um, in the case of the LGBT movement, its inclusion in cultural policies involves two main operations. The first one, uh, is the attribution of positive meaning to highly stigmatized aff affective sexual and social experiences. This involves uh, culturalizing uh, symbolic productions focused on those experiences, such as gay pride parades, drag, king, drag queen shows, and other forms of expression. That said, the symbolic practices of the LGBT community tend to be seen as components of a deviant pattern of behavior, uh, which causes varying levels of aversion in Brazilian society. And you may know that Brazil is still the, the, the country where, uh, that kills the most gays and transsexuals in the world. Uh, however, this conversion of LGBT symbolic production into culture is highly problematic when compared to other cases. Uh, take the case, for example, of Afro-Brazilian and indigenous cultures. Uh, the promotion and protection of their material and Im immaterial goods have long been part of the discourses of, on the valorization of the ethnic, racial matrices that compete in the formation of Brazilian cultural identity. Um, in both cases, the transformation of a policy of recognition into a cultural policy generates conflicts that are not necessarily anchored in moral or religious uh, stances even though these positions do eventually play a role, especially those in more conservative sectors of society. Uh, resistance to the introduction of LGBT culture in the ministry's structure is evident, uh, became evident in the research, uh, in the testimonies of the movement's activists, uh, because they report episodes of homophobia and transphobia among not only the ministry's employees, but also the culture makers from other areas. The second operation, uh, which is common in other emerging areas of the cultural policy, is to redirect LGBT activists' careers towards becoming cultural producers and agents. This requires them to acquire the vocabulary and repertoires they need to interact with such policies. Uh, this reorientation can be considered both the cause and the effect of the culturalization, as these actors' integration into the spaces 
of participatory democracy organized by the Mink leads to their self-recognition as culture makers. Um, it is worth highlighting that up until then, uh, the main contact between the Brazilian state and these activists had been the Ministry of Health, uh, which was related to its policies on HIV AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. This ministry had provided support for several gay pride parades, uh, as it saw the LGBT population, especially gay men and transsexuals, as the target for measures to combat and prevent STDs. One can say then that the restructuring of the MINC under the PT administrations favored the introduction of LGBT practices into the workings of the state apparatus, but this time, this process no longer, or not only, uh, follow the logic of providing access to the state to social groups at risk, uh, which seems then as the object of uh, uh, epidemiological intervention. Instead, uh, now at the Mink, the producers of these cultural manifestations were regarded as subjects that produce culture and are capable of participating in the formulation of cultural policies. During our study, the analysis of these changes raised a broader question. Uh, to what extent does this culturalization enable these groups to express their demands on the state and contribute to the creation of legitimate conditions for the in their inclusion uh, in the public life as full citizens? So what I'm questioning here is the relationship between recognition and inclusion. Uh, to respond to this question, we need to consider the issue of access to rights, which means the community's ability to exercise its citizenship. However, the aspect that interests us the most is the access to spaces of power. Uh, here, it's key to note how the official cultural policy became a locus for the dispute to define the intrinsic value of these groups who were fighting to legitimize their practice and ways of life. Um, this was going on at a time when the Mink had managed to partially dismantle uh, the articulation of interests, practices, and discourses that had traditionally constituted Brazil uh, official cultural policy. That is, the connections between, uh, imagine a triangle, right? Uh, a political elite, which is the state bureaucracy, uh, the economic elite uh, that directly or indirectly funds culture, and finally, an intellectual elite uh, called on to formulate the software of the cultural policy. Uh, up until then, the later elite, the intellectual elite, uh, had acted uh, as the prime mediator between the knowledge generator, generated in institutional spaces and the knowledge of excluded and marginalized groups. Uh, the creation of spaces for civil society participation in the discussion and formulation of cultural policies uh, somehow displaced uh, this network of interests as it introduced a fourth elite group into the game, uh, a sort of elite of the minorities, if we can say so, uh, such as black, indigenous, LGBT people, and so on. Uh, this elite was to dialogue with the state on equal footing, or at least in theory, uh, with the other elite from the cultural field, such as artists and producers, uh, the so-called artistic class. Well, this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, another way that the Mink used to include the interests and cultural expressions of the LGBT community in its policies was through the call for proposals, uh, either to support gay pride parades and, and to promote a broader spectrum of LGBT cultural activities. Uh, I don't wanna go into too much detail here on the analysis of the discourse used in these calls for proposals, uh, but I do want to share some of the general conclusions from our analysis. What we observed was a process that went from calls for proposals that focused on inclusion, visibility, and respect for sexual diversity. The first one was in 2005, and it was basically that. Uh, then, two calls that defended the right to sexual expression and the culture of peace, and the culture of peace is a, f a formula that appears in other ministries, uh, especially in the calls for proposals in 2006. And then, 
calls that were explicitly centered on the fight against homophobia, transphobia, sexual violence, and discrimination in the calls of 2008 and 9. And you can see there uh, this conception of the culture as a resource. Um, these calls for proposals sought to manage the conflicts that could arise between uh, antagonistic discourses, the gay and the anti-gay discourses, we, we can say so, by promoting sexual diversity and the culture of peace. However, discursive formation is not a delimited and sutured positivity. Um, the excess of meaning subverts the logic of diversity and imposes elements from the logic of difference, uh, which are particular to the field of LGBT discursivity. This gives rise to the emergence of physical and symbolic violence uh, when the goal was merely to assert an affirmative and inclusive position on a significant humanity that is based on a liberal and universalist logic. Um, in conclusion, I would like to highlight some challenges that our research faced in light of the change in the political situation in Brazil since Dilma Rousseff was ousted from power. The first problem is that everything in our analysis that we saw as consistent and permanent advances in cultural policy are now just archaeological artifacts. Uh, this is because the policies studied here have been suspended due to the austerity measures uh, being implemented. And in fact, if it weren't for the pressure of Brazilian culture makers, the ministry uh, would have been eliminated. Um, there are several problems now in, in the ministry. For one, the participatory mechanisms implemented during Gilberto Gil's administration uh, have been put on hold. Uh, also, the resources allocated to the cultural policies, new areas, no longer exist. And finally, the access to the mixed documents has been blocked. Several of the documents we analyzed have simply disappeared from the ministry's website, and we were only able to gain access to them thanks to the informal help of civil servants who work for the MINC. Another point that should be highlighted, and I, I finish here, is the importance of the conflicts currently arising from the interaction between the cultural policy and the policies on recognition uh, at a time when conservative positions are gaining momentum in Brazil. In 2017, last year, uh, just as we were about to conclude the study, uh, a series of incidents involving the censorship of art occurred, sparking intense public debate in Brazil. I mentioned some examples. The closure of the Queer Museum in Porto Alegre, uh, the Brazilian colleagues may remember that. Uh, the, the seizure of a work on exhibit in a museum in Campo Grande by the police, and the cancellation of a play in Sao Paulo. Uh, these incidents were the results of the organized actions of sectors of civil, so civil society, the political elite, and the ju judicial system. Uh, and they brought to light conflicts in which the freedom of artistic creation is pitted against social demands and, uh, of a moral and religious nature. Uh, the introduction of this type of controversy into the country's cultural policy, especially the relations between inequality and difference, deserves a place on the social sciences agenda of debate. And from a sociology of culture perspective, these issues bring the old fields over the definition and comprehensiveness of art uh, up to date. Uh, because they involve the symbolic production of minority groups, these disputes for legitimacy are in fact social political conflicts between interests that seek to exp expand rights and the interests of those who wish to maintain their privileges. Thank you. And now, oh, uh, Umberto Meza from Sebrap will briefly discuss the papers. Uh, more 15 minutes, right? <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, on the decks, on researchers, and um, for us. Well, I obviously have a big challenge to try to have uh, some uh, ideas of debate to, to integrate what is the common or different researchers, unless how is the proposal that we are uh, seeing in these, all these researchers on debate that you are proposing. Uh, in terms of that, I, I mean, I will try to have some ideas about what, what I see in terms of what it is common, probably, and some uh, comments on particularly each one of you in, in terms of uh, what I think is more values of your discussion and some questions that I have is probably to improve your, your debate. Well, um, I just raised two comments in terms of the general uh, or common issues. The first one is 
try to think if we are facing a new kind of popular mobilization in Latin America, a different context that you introduced, uh, you present here, probably we are seeing a kind of mobilization, a kind of mobiliz a sort of mobilization, a sort of organization of popular sectors to uh, enforce, uh, to uh, try to uh, improve or the popular agenda for uh, not equality, but I think to, I mean, respect or probably to tolerance or probably to have another kind of uh, cultural rights. Uh, I don't know if is this uh, like a um, uh, proposal that we face in the 18 years for new, new social movements. I think that, that, that those are the idea about the cultural agenda or whatever. Um, I don't think it's not only cultural. I think it's probably to have to shape a new kind of public policy in Latin America context. So I think this probably would be a, a one, uh, one point. Uh, and another, obviously, is this debate that we are facing in political theory about mobilization uh, for uh, Try to keep the difference uh, to achieve the equality. I mean, it's a big challenge that we face in different social actors. This is my comments on, on the general or uh, whatever, for or, or the text. On particularly, I think the work that Maria Angelica uh, put in the text about the experience in El Salvador or the abortion party have an uh, interesting point in terms of uh, how can we understand the role of the political party? I think, I mean, you talking more around this, uh, the justice, the federal federal court, no, it's not federal, but the national court in El Salvador, uh, all the feminist mobilization, but I, I, I think it's pr probably it's better to understand how the political party system and mostly the left parties try to have a song of mobilization inside the Latin America context to adopt a conservative agenda in terms of the women movements you know, for the abortion, etc. Because it's the case of Brazil with the PT government when it was the campaign in 2007. In Nicaragua with the Frente Sandinista, it's the same thing in Salvador where you know, etc. So I think it's an interesting point that we can talk about it. I just, I always, when, when everybody talk about this wage of uh, conservative, uh, ecumenical, or Pentecostalization, etc., um, I just think, what about the Catholic Church? I mean, what is the position? Because uh, all these different uh, conservative movements against abortion in Latin America, we saw uh, the protagonists of the evangelical, of the so another kind of church, evangelical, or um, et cetera, a new, uh, eh? But the Catholic, they have, a, a, they still have a, a higher impact in the, the political party system. So probably, uh, how we can we uh, put in this discussion about this, this this role? And obviously, I think we can maintain. We we need to continue to think about the women, our organization uh, have a kind of organization international movement. It's a network that try to improve the public policy for um, an agenda view in Latin America. I really like so much the work of Simone. Yeah, obviously, I think you have a brilliant effort to make a comparison about how uh, people can mobilize in the hardly context, very hardly context. I know what is the situation with Rio. I mean, I live in Rio too, so <laughs> we can talk about it. Um, but I think we need to try to think another question, that, another point that your research um, uh, try to uh, stimulate. One of them is about how we can think about mobilization of actors, social movements, in, uh, with few stimulation incentives. I mean, uh, the higher problem that we have in mobilization against narco-traffic, militia, et cetera, is your life in danger. I mean, the, 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 the most problem is you can die. So, uh, and this probably is a problem for the uh, activist theory, you know. Uh, so I think, how can we try to have another idea, another question uh, on the mobilization with fewer incentives? What is the really um, makes people mobilize in, in this context? And um, in the case of Rio, I don't know exactly what it is the case of Mexico is the same, but uh, in the case of Rio, I everything everybody everybody every time I try to think about militia, uh, 
how can we approach uh, another role of a militia, not only in terms of uh, criminality, but in terms of market and political? You know, in the case of Rio, militia are uh, like a private company. I mean, they control all the transportation system, uh, TV, Gato Danetti. <laughs> I don't know how to translate the Gato Danetti. But I mean, uh, it, it's interesting to, to understand what is the, 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 the importance of these actors who control the social life in different communities. And at the same time, to understand militia as political party or political system, political actors, you know. Uh, and I think try to uh, have these two, uh, both approach, two approach is probably to think uh, about the internal dispute that we are uh, mm, yeah, seeing in the case of Rio. The case of Josinha, Josinha in Rio, for example, for me, was very interesting how to see that militia is not a, a homogeneous actor. I mean, they have different, several internal dispute that is interesting to understand it, to to know what is exactly what kind of situation we are facing in favelas, for example. In the case of Mexico, I don't really know what is the, exactly this, this debate, but probably um, maybe similar, I don't know. Uh, about the, the research of Douglas, Douglas I, I like so much because you are using a methodology, very interesting to have an interaction that I, I see in fewer research actually, about the political system and the violence. Not only to try to think about repression, but uh, you know, this, the government or the governance. Well, this is the idea more interesting. However, I was thinking when you are talking, what about the elite, the local elite? I mean, in, in different Brazilian contexts, we have the problem that when you have a government that no use the repression or use fewer repression is like a signal of weakness. You know, so I think the, the, the better idea that I, that I saw in your presentation was about this paradox that you talk about. Where the police is more effective is where they are more weakness, probably. But the problem is the government is different. You, need, you have a government with serious problems with the legitimacy <laughs> or, uh, because they are not harder with the criminality, you know. So sometimes this elite in the South Zone, in Rio, for example, Ipanema, Copacabana, etc., they are demanding each, uh, each day more repression against criminality. And the problem is we are facing uh, this put speech uh, that try to make like a binomious uh, um, way of criminality. Uh, the problem is police against uh, narco traffic or police against criminality. But we know that it's more complex than that. So I don't know, I think the question, the only question that I will make to you is about, about this. What is the, the, the dispute dispute, this, this debate that we are facing about the speech, public speech, between elites and the money more repression and, and the, the situation of different uh, popular sectors, probably. Uh, the debate from uh, José, I don't know about José, but José, um, you know, I, I try to think, we are talking about this relation between public policy, state, and the LGBT movements. I was talking about the feminist movement too, because it's similar to the debate that we are facing in the 90 years probably, when the state was making the absorption of the gender uh, public policy. Because the absorption, obviously, uh, is occurred, but the, the idea was to control the agenda of gender. Uh, and probably we are facing some similar uh, experience in the case of uh, gay movement. Uh, at the same time, I think that we need to have a look or to adopt another debate about how this movement have another fit or another insertion in the social uh, debate too. I mean, obviously we, we want to change the public policy, we want to uh, stay more uh, progressive or more, you know, but at the same time I think the gay movement as, as the well, the feminist movement may, are making now and the feminist movement made a big work in the social debate. I think probably if we, think, if we can see the another extreme of the line, uh, the state, but also the, uh, the public debate, media, organizations, NGO, etc., uh, will be interesting to, to understand what is the strategy of the movement in the both, uh, the both side. And finally, uh, sorry, Simone, I think with you we'll talk about it. I was almost forgotten. I love the idea to understand this mobilization that we are facing in different in national, local contexts with how 
they integrate it on the international scenario. I think the case of Marielle, uh, you brought, uh, you talk about the case of Berta Cáceres in Honduras, for example, is, is, is exactly, I mean, similar. It's the same situation. I mean, you have, we, 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 Berta Cáceres was a leader, a female leader uh, in the eco ecological area yeah, for the water, etc. Indigenous too, etc. But the, his, his assassination stimulated international mobilization too, as well is occurring now with the case of Maria de Franco. I think we need to understand how this case of interaction between global level, global agenda, with these local movements could be interesting to, to make a new ethnography of the popular movements. I don't know if I have more time, but for me, it's okay. <laughs> well, thanks so much. <laughs> you have comments? Uh, we, sh we you can answer, yeah, and after, if there is time, people can. Oh, we can open for if you, someone has a question, reactions, comments, please. Hello again, I'm uh, Travis Canol, third year history PhD at Duke University. And I have a question specifically for, um, for Simone, Douglas, and Jose. Um, Simone, in terms, of, um, in terms of cultural movements and especially critical uh, uh, suspicion of the state, uh, what role if we eventually, if, if Brazil or even the United States gets a, a mildly progressive government back, um, what role do state institutions like the Ministry of Culture have in this sort of soft power solution to uh, narco-trafficking? I know when I was an intern uh, with the Prefeitura de Belo Horizonte, when I studied in, in the UFMG, we had a Escola Integral, and it apparently did reduce certain um, drug addiction rates among teenagers by extending the school hour. So there is some soft power, like soft power approaches that uh, work on a small scale. I would wonder how they would work on a larger scale. Um, Douglas, uh, excellent uh, presentation in, in terms of clarity and conclusion. Um, my one question is when you, with your with some of the conclusions, I can't help but think about politics as sometimes and um, think about not only uh, how difficult it is to tell the popular audiences like in the media the difference between correlation and causality, but also the, the finessing that you'll have to do when you say, oh, um, violence is five times less under conservative governments. And I can see someone coming and taking that and say, see, elect the conservative governments. We're the only ones that, we're the, that, do, that get rid of violence. And so how do you, how do you as a scientist finesse, finesse that to get the conclusions across, which you, know, you have to go where the data leads, but also do so knowing that you're intervening in a political environment. And Jose, um, I was wondering, because we're having a similar problem with climate change in our own country in terms of archives being erased, fears in the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States that certain data could be eventually lost. There are some archiving policies that are, that are sometimes discretionary, but mostly, uh, but sometimes mandatory as well, of archiving previous pages of the Environmental Protection Agency. I was wondering if, um, talvez, Terá uma iniciativa polar no Ministério de Cultura, no governo em geralmente, para mandar cada governo arquivar e ter uma página arquivada do governo anterior com a página como estava naquele momento. E nós não temos em tudo, mas temos em algumas coisas e Às vezes cria temor hum? quando nós não temos o arquivamento é, obrigatório. É, desculpa. Mas é, é isso. Quais qual iniciativas estão tendo para que não tenham de 
correr, uh, um, ter recursos só para vias informais. Obrigado. all for the very interesting presentations. I have two questions, one for Helica and the other one for Douglas. Uh, Helica, I think that there are two patterns in regarding recognition of rights in Latin America. One is through the political system and the other one to, through the judicial system. You have all Either you can pass laws in the Congress or in the Assembly, or you go to the Supreme Court. Now, I would like to understand how, uh, if this is so, uh, how the Salvadorian case fits in, in, this, in this picture. And for Douglas, well, I enjoy a lot of presentation. You actually have two questions. Huh? One, why? Crime raises in in during a um, good economic moment, and then how pu effective public policies uh, can uh, can come to forth. Uh, you answered. I I understand that you answered the second question, and maybe your uh, your thesis is about the second question, but you have also interesting things to, to, to think about the, the first one, because besides your, your, your data, the most, most paradoxical issue is that uh, crime raises in regions that are, uh, they are increase economically uh, developing more than others. You see, the, the, what happened under the Lula government was a, a, a extreme successful case of economic growth in Northeast. And uh, you have, uh, at the same time, crime growing. And I think you, you have a, an interesting problem. Maybe I, I would like to know if you have some hypothesis about how this relation can be explained. OK, thank you. Would you like one more question? Hi, my name is Daniela. I'm from Unicamp. It's not like it's not a question. It's just a comment for you. I, a colleague of mine, uh, maybe it will, it will answer one of your questions. But a colleague of colleague of mine uh, studied about um, debate in Brazilian Congress about legalization of abortion. And she find out about the documents and the videos that uh, there were two groups, one favorable to the legalization, another wasn't. Uh, and the one that wasn't was uh, the Catholic and religious men, <laughs> white men in general. <laughs> Uh, and that the arguments, that's her thing. Uh, we study uh, science and policy, uh, science and technology politics. And the thing is, uh, <laughs> the guys that were against the legalization of abortion, they used a lot more of scientific... Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, arguments than the ones that were favorable to legalization of abortion. They use more about legal rights and human rights. So, just a comment. If you want, I can pass uh, yeah. the. Yes. Yeah, sure. you want to. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you for the presentations. Very quick questions. One to Simone. Uh, I'm more used to the literature on police protesting. Uh, so, not uh, usually. I'm not usually seeing fields where we have militia, but in this literature, when you have a, a rep strong repression towards pacific or activists or something like that, it usually triggers a mechanism of um, of backfire. So the the movement gets stronger. We had that in in June 2013. So what? How does the field? Uh, what happens in your field where you have the militia? Does it change something? And for Douglas, um, 
I would like you to, we have here a discussion on the, in some, especially in Sao Paulo, on the decrease of the homicide um, rates. And one of the strong hypotheses is that it's because of the organized crime. So how does it interfere, how does this variable interfere in your analysis? Have you ever considered, considered that? So, Angelica, you... <laughs> Thanks a lot for your. Okay. <laughs> I need to answer with the microphone. Sorry. Uh, thank for the, your uh, your question and your thought. Uh, well, about the political party, yes, it's a very good question. Uh, not only for in El Salvador case, even in Nicaragua. And as far as I try to understood why this thing happened, as I don't have time to present the, the whole research, but I try to think this phenomenon to main line of yes, of explanation. One of, the, one of them is the after the guerrilla, many of that guerrilla became in political party and when they go to the political system, they have to adapt they all, they discuss to the these kind of rules. This is why I, I mentioned in 2009 was the first time that FMLN can get the option to get in power. And from this from that time, they said, no, okay, we are not so left. We are a center left option. And in this kind of position, the abortion right is not a, a good coin of change for, for the leftist party in general in Latin America. And the other thing, and I'm really interested in this, uh, what about the, the root of this guerrilla, this social movement? And many of these social movements during the guerrilla uh, are based or are hard connection with the, the theology of liberation. You know, and this theology of liberation is uh, very interesting in, in many, many ways, but in sexual moral, they are very conservative. Even the, the main leader of the FMLN are so conservative about sexual um, reproduction point, and in many cases, because they consider uh, itself as Christian. I'm a Catholic, I work with the people, I can be in favor of killing people, the, yeah, I don't know. The, I, I think, and even in Brazil, I read about that. What is the impact of the theology of liberation in these uh, leftist parties? Uh, I don't know, I tried to see through interview literature to understand why this, why the leftist can uh, close the, deba the debate about, uh, about the abortion for, for so long. And let me see the other. I don't know if I answer because it's a very complicated question, but. The Catholic Church, yeah, okay. It's, it's interesting to see, uh, and not only, again, in the Salvador case, how in, in the 80s and even in the 90s, the power of the Catholic Church in the government and the, the, the debate are, are so strong. But something changed in the last year in, in Latin America, especially in Central America. There have been a very strong change in demographic terms where the evangelical and Pentecostal sector are growing and this uh, evangelical sector mostly are conservative in terms of sexual uh, and moral issues. And this changed in some part the role of the Catholic Church in this debate and the debate of the Catholic Church with the state. But other things are interesting in that because in, in terms of public position about sexual and moral agenda, Catholic Church and these evangelical leaders go together to the public space to oppose to the abortion, to the uh, uh, other LGBT rights, uh, or whatever. But when 
in the in the national space the debate is about the privilege the yes the privilege the government privilege that some religions has for instance the catholic church in many cases they split and they have tension and they they appear separately but in some issues like this they go together and they have uh, overcome their difference. And this is very interesting because this is happened not only in Salvador, I can see that in Argentina, in, in Chile, and well, in, in fact, I guess in Brazil too. The, the impact of the international arena, I really, yes, I try to, to, to take some, some idea of CAC and seeking about the international networking work uh, to push this issue at the national level. And this is still happening, but I'm, I'm worried, I, I'm, I try to see more deeply what about this international networking from the conservative side of the history and what, uh, what are the impact of the, this uh, international network inside the national organization. But because, because in El Salvador, the impact of the inter, international scrutiny was so, so high. But this organization that I mentioned before, they are only uh, integrated by five persons, only by five. And there are a, a lot of big organizations that, that are pushed the debate, but at the national level, it's high because all these personnel are threatened and, well, they have to de deal with many things. What, it, what the Salvadorian activists tried to shape, uh, yeah, shape or reshape the abortion debate to, to improve it, to change the law. They are changing the strategy in different, in different uh, time, for instance, uh, since 2009, they tried to, to challenge the abortion total ban through the court. Why? Because in 2009, there was two uh, successful cases in Latin America about that, Colombia and Mexico. And they tried to, to, to apply this successful uh, strategy in El Salvador. Doesn't work. But uh, actually, they they try to 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 prove there are in fact there are two bill of law to with the purpose to change the legislation of the abortion, and this is because in some part they I, they can have some visibility even not only at the international level even in the national level and some legi legitimacy that they didn't have before. Secular, secular, secularization of the strategy. Sorry, this is one of the, my my main uh, research in in Argentina even, and we can see this kind of action, especially from 2000. And yes, this is what what we need to see more deeply because they have a lot of resources and forces both at the international level, in human rights arena, but even in the universities and in a big center of bioethic or scientific study. And it's not the same in the public debate. Try to, to, to refuse to, to, to opposite to cultural or religious argument. Uh, it's not the same that when you try to deal with scientific and objective uh, knowledge. And this is what, what we're dealing, not only in abortion, even in LGBT, LGBT issues and other, and other issues with sexual and moral agenda, that one. Um, well, thanks for all the excellent questions and that you're all still here. Um, 
First of all, for your question, I think it's very hard to, to mobilize uh, if you know the context of militias in Rio, but also the context of all the narco-trafficking actors in Mexico. But what you mentioned as the incentives, which, uh, which is a very political science uh, question for the incentives to mobilize uh, in certain contexts, I think this is somehow uh, guided my analysis in the, my PhD dissertation. And I think um, when your life is in danger, you have to fewer resources and you have fewer incentives. That's that's clear. That's um, that's a problem of activist theory that you mentioned. But I think you have some sort of strategies, and you have. Uh, I think what you mentioned later, the transnationalism and the and the connection of. Uh, international networks that, for example, Better Casters had been uh, receiving threats for the last five years. Of, so, I mean, she knew she was in danger, Maria de Franco and other uh, activists that were assassinated. I think in Colombia, from uh, since the peace, uh, since the peace uh, agreement, there has been 150 activists that were assassinated and were murdered. So I think they know their, their lives are in danger, but at the same time, they have uh, they count somehow with the imponderable or with something that uh, would put, protect them, which is visibility. Visibility at international level, this is somehow uh, what I found in Guerrero especially. And invisibility in their national context, in their local context, which is very um, uh, insidious uh, relations that you have to be somehow not that known in your context, but you have to have your highlights, uh, international highlights on you in order to uh, be alive. I think what you mentioned about militias is uh, also very important. They are not homogeneous. They are not uh, that uh, Coe's actors, so there are several fam uh, families in Rio acting as militias for the last uh, 10 years in 2008, 12, 12 years, I think. They, they got stronger in 2006, but they somehow were disarticulated in 2008 with the CPI of militias, and, and uh, somehow they managed to reorganize and not search that much for the political power. You mentioned that if we could consider them political parties, but parties, and I think uh, after 2008, what they did was to hide from the public sphere because the Jeromino, the the, uh, the leaders of uh, the main militias in Rio, are uh, incarcerated for the last I don't know five years. So they reorganized, and they are certainly to be understood as an economic actor. They move. Um, uh, enormous amounts of money, and I think with the Marielle uh, investigations now, I think we are now observing how much money they they move, move in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the case of Mexico, they count with several paralegal actors as well. But uh, answering to your question, Mart, I think uh, the the backfire that you would observe, that you normally observe in that case. I think you would you would observe in in Guerrero, but not in Rio. Although I think June uh, 2013 as an outlier because of the involvement of and the presence of state agents in in Mexico is not that they since they don't have militias uh, that clear and the the state repression it does uh, have an important uh, account on their mobilization or the demobilization. I think uh, the repression when it comes from the state agent, um, which plays a double agent. I've heard in, in, in Campo Grande, for example, that a uh, policeman would come to your house and say something, and the other day he would come with, without his uniform. So you have this double parameter. Uh, and uh, in that case, I think you don't have backfire. I saw what I could observe is that two uh, dichotom. Uh, Dichotomic. I don't know if I can say that. Um, uh, postures of the social movements of, of activists, uh, which is complete demobilization, complete invisibility, and the maximum visibility of their 
of their causes. And I think, um, although I do think June 2013 is an outlier, I think the mobilization in Rio is much harder. They don't, what militias they do uh, overall is not to let people gather to think uh, collectively uh, their, their problems. So I think uh, uh, in terms of Habermas, in terms of people thinking the, the public sphere, this is a, a real uh, issue. And that is, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I guess um, first the question of the elite versus uh, the general public or the poor sector. Surprisingly, we actually see more support for police violence and really oppressive policies among the poor than we do the elite. So if you look at the surveys, the poor are most likely to be killed or have negative interactions with police, but they want a violent police, right? They want a police that does things immediately. Um, so part of my field work, I went around to different states asking uh, state deputies, okay, so what, what do people ask you about public security? What do they want? Do they want prevention or do they just want repression? And about 70%, and even these were deputies from PISO, PT, PMDB, pretty much any party you chose, oh, they want more police, right? They just want police because you feel safer if there's a police officer on the corner, someone put if you have a man standing on the corner with a machine gun, you're going to feel safer in your neighborhood. Um, the question about the right and the public debate. Yeah, so I'm not sure what to make of this because by itself, not, nothing about ideology should affect the outcomes because uh, we've taken care of resource uh, uh, distribution and resource provision. My working theory right now is that because voters punish right parties harsher, because right parties pretty much took over the public security debate in Brazil, right? There's this argument that the left is afraid to discuss security. It's taboo. Um, I think a lot of that should go back to the dictatorship and, um, you know, a lot of these governors and, you know, even national poli uh, po politicians were either tortured or they were uh, exiled by the government and the military police, which run security for the most part, uh, was part of that. Um, but I think because voters think right parties do better and they punish them worse, I think right parties have to pay more attention to security. The left can focus more on inequality and um, social issues. But I think the important thing you see, though, if we take away the, the right finding there, is that if you spend more on education, you can reduce crime. But also, regardless of party, if you spend more on policing, you can also do reduce crime. So it's not necessarily that the right is using their resources more effectively, it's just maybe they're uh, giving more attention to it. Um, yes, yeah, so the question of why crime has increased in Brazil. Um, so actually this goes with the, the next question about Sao Paulo and the, the massive crime drop. All right, so in, in Sao Paulo, you have the PCC hypothesis, which is just that because the PCC took over organized crime, uh, violence is declined because you now have a non-state actor who controls crime in poor areas. And you do see this, right? If you look through the documents they seize, they have a court. So if you rob someone, you can take your, uh, if you're robbed by someone on the street, you can take your case to the PCC and they'll judge the robbery for you. And if the person's found guilty, you'll have things like you may have your arm broken, you may get shot in the foot. If you engage in more violent crimes like murder or rape, they have a death penalty, um, which I, I think is very interesting. And Brazil doesn't formally have the death penalty, but in many areas you do, either by the gangs or by uh, the police implementing it uh, on their own. Um, so I don't think the PCC or gangs by themselves explain the changes in violence. They have spread. So um, where I'm working at the University of Chicago now, we have a big project on how the PCC has spread, which basically Sao Paulo caused the problem by uh, sending prisoners to prisons around the country and then teaching other prisoners how to organize. Um, but that happened in the kind of after 2006, about 2007, 2008, violence was already going up. The question of why, I don't know, I, I think the Northeast, when you go there, you find there's basically no plans of how to deal with security. 
So a lot of my research involves like looking at state policies, and there just are not state policies in a lot of states. Like, no one you can read through their party platforms, and it's like uh, increased cooperation between the military police and the civil police, uh, have a more effective police force, but there's they don't do anything. Uh, so when I was in Rio Grande do Norte, which has become, I think, the most violent state or one of the most violent states in Brazil, talking with the police and the governor goes to Colombia to figure out how to reduce violence. And he leaves half the police at home. He takes a couple of politicians and I think one person from the Ministerio Publico and then he leaves the military police and the civil police um, there. Um, in general, with the relationship with inequality, I've heard, I haven't read that much into it, but I heard there's kind of like the inverted U relationship. So when you're really unequal and you're really equal, crime declines, right? Because if you're really equal, there's no need to commit crime because you have a lot to lose. If you're really poor, basically you don't have time to think about it. But when you're in that kind of middle area where now you have more resources, right? Like you're not worried just about survival from food, um, which I think uh, if you read through a lot of the literature, especially in Brazil, like this idea of, of like uh, poor people commit crimes just at, at, at higher rates is not true. They commit different types of crime, but the wealthy, as we see from Lava Jato, commits other um, crimes. So yeah, so it could be the inverted U relationship. Um, and I, I think just the lack of general government policies. You do see when people implement policies, they can work if you think them through, right? So Pernambuco temporarily worked. Unfortunately, I, in my opinion, it was a, a repression-based, let's fill the prisons, and that can only work for so long. But it's good for politicians because Eduardo Campos was on track to maybe become next president, or at least he was, would have competed for it until he took, you know, uh, the nose dive, I think it was here in Sao Paulo. Um, so people like respected that. Now what happened to his successor? If you go back to Pernambuco, violence is worse than it's ever been. He's not, his successor is not doing anything different than him, but you know you can only use repression for um, so long. Now you have a lot of cases, right? Bahia um, copied Pernambuco's Pact for Life, Pact of Bella Vida, and it did absolutely nothing. And we can't say that this is because it was even like different ideologies, PT in Bahia and PSB in Pernambuco. So different, but they're both uh, left, right? So I think that means that you, know, you need to think about your security plans in terms of the individual strategies uh, rather than just, oh, this one seemed to work, so now let's implement it everywhere without taking anything into context. Okay, very quickly, so we can go to the beer time. Um, your question was about, if I understood your question, was about the public debate. Um, I don't know if I answer your question, but I think uh, the LGBT community, the LGBT movement, um, it built a kind of pitfall in the past few decades, in the past two decades, especially uh, since the beginning of the, the, the Pride parades. Uh, which is uh, a very strong emphasis in visibility. So uh, we thought that if we gain visibility, everything is okay, everything is, is it, it's a solution for everything. So let's put uh, the gay couple in the soap opera and it's okay. Let's uh, build uh, cultural policies for LGBT community and it's fine. And then we see uh, Two decades ago, uh, two decades later, uh, we are still the country that uh, kill more gays and transsexuals in the world. So clearly, visibility uh, doesn't work as we we ex we expected to uh, to work. So uh, this is a problem, and I think th the problem of these uh, cultural policies for the LGBT communities is, is exactly that that we put so much expectation on that, but it's not enough. I mean, uh, there are other arenas that should be uh, attacked, uh, like education, for example, but it's really strong, it's really hard in Brazil to put uh, th this debate. Um, and uh, other things that are very simple, such as, um, I don't know, the recognition of the social name for transsexual individuals. 
this was a very uh, uh, a very interesting uh, conquer in some places, uh, but it's not a, a official uh, uh, politic in Brazil, so uh, it's a problem. So th there are some some uh, problems now that I, I, I think uh, that have to do with this uh, strong emphasis on visibility as if it were uh, sufficient. And your question about uh, archiving, um, what we do have is um, a law uh, which is called uh, Lei da Transparência. I don't know if it's the name, official name, but we call it like that, uh, which officially allow us to uh, to have access to all kinds of documents from the government. So uh, you can go to the website of uh, Transparencia and then ask them to, to send you everything. Uh, since Dilma uh, was deposed, uh, it, it doesn't work. I mean, uh, we go, we, we write the emails and they don't come. So uh, we don't know what, what's happening uh, on this issue. So. Uh, in our case, uh, with these documents we analyzed, it was quite easy because we had some friends working on the Ministry of Culture and they gave us uh, the documents. So we had a way to, to find this, but uh, it's really hard and uh, the, 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 the scholars that uh, study public policies in Brazil are now uh, uh, struggling with that and trying to uh, download everything uh, when it's possible. So let's see what happens now. So I like thank you all the participants for the excellent papers you presented, and I like to thank you all for being here till the end. <laughs> and I like to remember you all that tomorrow, ten o'clock, we will be just across the street here. No, it's here. No, it's, here. it's here? It's Monday. No, next, week. next two weeks. Sorry, tomorrow, 10 <laughs> o'clock <It's> here. The same, <laughs> the same place. We'll wait for you. Thank you. Thank you.